CBRE, I'm the head of the project management group at CBRE. So, just want to thank Amcham, who's no longer in the room, uh, for <laughs> having me here today to talk. So, uh, as you can all tell, giving talks in front of groups of people is, is not what I do a lot of. Um, I'm primarily dealing with uh, people such as yourself, contractors, uh, vendors, suppliers, of course, working with clients one on one. So, but uh, today uh, the topic is we'll call it overcoming some of the challenges in the emerging market, uh, especially some of the challenges that we face as a project manager. Now, I'm just going to cut to I I tend to talk a lot, and I'll probably go over 25 minutes. I don't know how we ended up at 25 minutes, but I tend to go over, so I'm just going to cut straight to the chase and go straight to the conclusions. So hopefully at the end this will all make sense to you. So quite simply, uh, I will say, be wary or when as you're working in Vietnam, be wary of those who say they can do everything for you. Okay. Second point, don't try and do it yourself. I think we have any clients here, but we're talking about clients who think I'll do it myself. So don't try to do that yourself. And the last point. Don't make cheap doing your bid out, doing your building, doing it as cheap as possible. Don't make that your number one priority. So that's the gist of the talk today, and that's the gist of what the challenges that we face. Uh, so if you do hear a client say that any of those things, right, or uh, you're saying that yourself, I think one of your clients is saying that, basically run away. Run away as fast as you can. Right? It's not the type of client that you really want to be working with uh, because it's just going to end up being a lose-lose situation in the end. So, uh, if you do run into that, uh, the next best thing to do is give me a call right? and we'll sit down and we'll go through it. Right? So, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I think some of you know me, uh, some of you don't. Uh, I'm not here to talk about CBRE project management services. So we've taken all references to CBI office, off of this presentation. I'm talking more about, or talking from, uh, call it 25 years of experience uh, working in Asia. So I have the unique, I don't know, milestone or uh, whatever you want to call it, where in a few weeks I'll be turning 50 years old, believe it or not, and I will have spent 25 years of my life in my home country of the US and 25 years abroad in Asia. So, I don't know if that's cause for celebration or just sit back there, <laughs> what the heck am I doing? Uh, so, you kind of go back now, imagine the taxes you have to pay. Yeah, <laughs> murdered. So, uh, unfortunately, I haven't earned enough. <laughs> so, I've been able to write all that off. <laughs> um, just real briefly. 25 years in Asia, 17 of that was spent in Japan, living, working in Japan for a number of uh, companies ranging from what we'll call pure Japanese companies. Um, some big names were, uh, I'll say, a lot of lessons learned uh, to rather large US architectural design firms, working as a project manager and architect, to Bogus Land Lease, some of you will know, uh, one of the world's largest. Uh, project management, construction management groups. Uh, worked with Bovis uh, in Japan, uh, where I would say management in Australia felt that a senior project manager who's fluent in Japanese is best situated in Singapore. So they transferred me to Singapore. And shortly after that, they changed the whole business model and moved this all over to India, uh, where uh, I want to say the international or the, the global economic crisis hit. Uh, about two weeks after you know, the terrorist attacks in Mumbai. Uh, we were there for that, had to be evacuated, enjoyed getting shot at. Uh, but we were all evacuated two weeks later, the whole economy tanked, and all of us expats were laid off. So, 
anyway, I was able to come, come take refuge uh, in, in Thailand for a few weeks and then quickly found a job in Vietnam um, where I worked with uh, VWA as the managing director and most recently um, with CBRE. What's common amongst all of that is obviously Asia, uh, but the experiences, the challenges that were faced in working with clients, uh, vendors, contractors, uh, where what I'm going to talk about today is largely drawn from what we'll call it life's experience. Like I said, it's not specific to Vietnam, uh, but Vietnam being an emerging market, um, a lot of these traditions or thinking exist. Quite honestly, 25 years ago in Japan, they existed as well. But with proper attention and all efforts of all of us that are in this room, if you raise those to the right people, you know, if you know anyone in industry, in government even, uh, the benefits of, we'll call it, good project management, good consulting, is, will, I would say, can be learned, can be understood. We've seen some good results with Turner's involvement in Vietnam. Um, and hopefully the, well, the trickle-down effect will happen a lot quicker, but it takes the efforts of all of us in order to have it, for that to happen quicker. Okay. So, um, anyway, like I said, talking about overcoming traditional challenges in the emergency, the emerging uh, design and construction industry. So, but, uh, whoa. Okay, this is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing anything. <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> well, what happened? No. Huh? Hang on. Oh my. Anybody know how to work an apple? The bottom one on the Okay. Why don't we get rid of that stick? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, what's my complete? Track of mine here. Uh, in order to talk, uh, obviously, I would say most of the people in the room uh, do understand what project management is and uh, the correct way to do it. Um, I think uh, many of uh, our, uh, say, clients that we work with do not understand project management uh, as a pure consulting role, um, and therefore, the challenges we faced. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, a typical thought of many project managers uh, working in challenging economies or challenging markets is, yes, it is a lot like cat herding, uh, where you know, things just, no one has a set course or a set agenda, they just go about and do what they want to do. So, but the beef is here. <laughs> but, I think in Vietnam, one of the things that has been uh, quite surprising to me uh, is the level of misunderstandings or lack of awareness that exists in Vietnam regarding project management. Um, you know, it starts with clients, uh, through to investors, to CBRE brokers, to CBRE management to consultants, to contractors, and on down the line. Uh, quite honestly, it's, it's been uh, very surprising. Um, it's not exactly the level that I expected when I came here, but it is the level. So consequently, and we mentioned this earlier, we need to spend a lot of time educating, uh, educating our clients, edu educating the supply chain, which is very, very important. Uh, for that to happen in order for the projects that are done in Vietnam or in an emerging market so that these projects can be successful. Uh, what is going on here? 
<laughs> so, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this one. Um, most of most people understand what project management is about, um, what we spend our time on. Obviously, what's important to any project is time, cost, and quality parameters. What balance do you achieve uh, in any specific project in order for it to be successful? In Vietnam, we need to spend a little bit of extra time on risk management um, because the risk uh, in many cases is actually beginning with the client right? and his not understanding of what is the proper way to execute the project. So some of the traditional challenges that we face and I'll talk about in a minute, those are actually risks. Right? And for us and for the whole project to be successful or to achieve a win-win situation, we need to recognize those the traditional challenges, the traditional thinking, as a risk. And then what do we do to mitigate that and educate our clients so that they can be successful and pull off their projects? So, um, you know, project managers, uh, true tasks, um, you know, you can write all this, most effective use of dollars and time and human resources, but in general, uh, the best definition of project management <laughs> Uh, we're here to prevent the oh shits. Right? So if you have a project manager and you hear him say, oh shit, that means you're in trouble. He's forgotten something. Someone's forgotten something or something hasn't been done. There's a problem. If you're the client, you're likely going to have to pay. If, a, if you're a contractor, there's going to be a delay. <laughs> okay. So if your project manager is saying, oh shit, there's a problem. So that's a yeah, very good typical definition of uh, project management. So, um, 2014, um, we're in a world of specialization. Almost every project, every building, every office that's done, constructed, built, fitted out, what have you, is really an exercise in specialization. Right? There cannot effectively be one person who can do everything and do it all well. Unfortunately, this is the thinking of many clients. Uh, we do a lot with fit outs and clients say, don't need you, you're a consultant. I don't need you, your fee's too high. My HR manager, my IT manager, they can do it all themselves, okay? Uh, if any of you have been to the CDRE office, perfect case in point. Alright, fortunately Mark Townsend is not here, <laughs> but I wish he was, or at least our HR manager, he should be here. Uh, where it was attempted to do it themselves, done wrong. This is before the PM group existed, so if you clarify mm -hmm. all that, we'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately they won't give us any money to fix it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, if you're going about doing it yourself, then uh, there's always going to be a lot of risk uh, involved. So, anyway, on to uh, we'll call it the local challenges, the local tradition, the local thinking, which a lot of us face. And, like I said, this is what we need to overcome uh, in order to achieve better results in Vietnam. So the typical challenges, uh, I'll do it myself, I'll manage it myself. I, I, know, I know better than any consultant. Ego-driven, okay? and I think all of us in this room can point to our uh, favorite project in Ho Chi Minh that we use as an example. Um, sorry, in advance. Uh, <laughs> uh, champagne taste on a beer budget. Typical in Vietnam, very, very typical. Uh, I've got a lot of experience with this one. Other tradition, it's always been done this way. We build everything out of block, lovingly known as death brick. Right? You can do anything with death brick in Vietnam. You, know, you can do a beef tenderloin out of death brick if you want. So, and then a little bit more serious challenge that we face and something uh, that I'm 
think we can all help out with is the lack of experience or the lack of proper resources. Now this is uh, something that I would say is very close to my heart, um, where not just educating clients, but in order to educate clients, I can't do it all myself. So consequently, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time with this young fellow on typicating, teaching, preaching, whatever you want. So the more that he learns two years from now or a year from now, he can spread that message to someone else, right, and on down the line. So I'll spend a lot of time with my team. My team is my most valuable resource and my most treasured resource. So, anyway, um, at the, the so, uh, this was a great slide, I liked it. <laughs> um, typical. Uh, many of our clients, so yeah, you know, time, cost, quality, right? Okay, time, cost, quality. I want it fast, I want it cheap, and I want it great. Right? Impossible. <laughs> Utopia. It cannot happen. Alright. This this one comes up quite a bit. Free. Alright, I want it tomorrow. And I want it done for free. You probably have to deal with that quite a bit. Alright. The results. I think we've all seen the results. And this is what we need. This is the message that we need to push back on clients, right? push back on the government, I don't know. We got cameras in here? Oh, they do. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a webcam, by the way, you know that. Hello, Prime Minister. No, it's very important okay, that clients, everyone, even Greg, understand the results of wanting too much, too fast, or too little money. Okay? The end result is not good. I guarantee it. So, yeah, at the root of all this is a lack of understanding, a lack of awareness of what is proper project management, what is proper construction, what is proper fabrication, right? what is proper cost control, right? how to do it the right way. And who are the people that are available in the market to help? So it's that lack of awareness, um, which is really our biggest challenge. Okay. So, you know, unfortunately, many developers in Vietnam, you can point to the Bing Coms or the Bing Groups and the Vitexcos, uh, recent one a uh, week and a half ago, I want to build a resort in Ta Trang. I, I want this and I want that, da, 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 da. and I've got $15 million to do it. That's a ton of money. Okay, well, how big do you want this resort to be? Ah, it's going to be at least 40,000 square meters, and I want this, and pools, and spas, and stuff like that. The response to him was, okay. Uh, I'm not even going to try to, to approach you about doing project management services for the length of the project. I'm going to approach you and I'm going to say, first thing you need is to sit down and talk seriously with someone about this project. So I'll give you a service fee to put together what we call a project execution plan. We'll put together a design brief, a project brief, a schedule, a preliminary budget. And that's all I'm going to offer you right now. I guarantee at the end of that, you're going to be rethinking or you're going to be looking out looking for more investors. So, you know, this idea of I can just click my heels, right, move on, and something's going to pop out of the air. Um, yeah, it's a fantasy, it's a fairy tale. Okay. It's Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz. Right? <laughs> so, these are the, the challenges and uh, what we need to do uh, to fix all of that. Okay. So, yeah, there's a lot of skilled and talented people such as ourselves, who are able to say, see that and pass on that message. We also need to be aware of, or let our clients be aware of, that, sorry, but there's just as many people who are unskilled, unaware, uh, more than willing to take a client's money. Right? 
<laughs> so uh, I'll go into to a bit of a stab at design and build groups later on. Uh, but uh, it's an issue uh, that I would say in, we do a lot of fit out work uh, where we run into design and build groups quite often. Right? And we lose work to design and build groups regularly. But many times the client calls us back later and says, can you come and help out? Right. We've had a, a very I'll call it recent example uh, where, yes, we were passed over for the, the project management services for this particular fit out. But at the end of the project, the client had to have the final progress claim from the contractor, final invoices, whatever, had to be assessed for their headquarters so that the payment could be processed. So they asked us, can you do a final cost assessment? So, sure, we can do that. Uh, give us the, the original VOQ, we'll set up a time, we'll do an inspection of the facility, and then let's get their, their last progress claim. So we did all that, walked through, you know, original VOQ, it says uh, there'll be uh, 25 down lights, do the site inspection, five down lights, or, I'm sorry, 20 down lights, uh, final claim, 25 down lights. Okay, so is there a change order? Okay, is there somewhere, is there documentation that says five down lights were taken out? No, it didn't happen. I right. designed a build contractor, didn't pass that through. All right, of course not. And vice versa. Yeah, things that were added really weren't, but yet there they were in the progress plan. In the end, on let's say it's about a four hundred and fifty thousand dollars fit out cost. Yeah, it seems small, but we found close to thirty thousand dollars worth of mistakes in the final thing. And this was the client's most trusted partner. Worked with this guy before. Right? The fact of the matter is he wasn't managing the project. He was just getting it done. Right? So the client would have known that, and many of our other clients don't know that, don't see it. So they just let it happen. So anyway, we'll, we'll kind of run through these. Um, I'm more interested in, the, in talking with you and answering your questions. But yeah, I'll manage my, myself. And we talked about this. I know everything there is to know about design and construction. My money, everyone will do what I say. Uh, someone else will be responsible for, for what I don't know. And like I said, it's all too common. Developers, investors, often hires white. Particular project in the south of Vietnam. I don't know if anyone knows this. Typical client. I'm going to build myself a mega city. Yeah. It's in total three and a half kilometers long. All right. So, uh, Charles, can you come uh, help out and take a look at uh, the project and what we need to do? Uh, we go down to the south of Vietnam. Sit down in the room with three other people and say, okay, so this is your project. Where's your project team? You know, who's, who's design director? Girl puts her hand up. Who's the design director? How many people do you have on your team? Well, just me. Who's the project manager of the project? Kid about the same age as you, 27, 28, says, yeah, I graduated instructor of civil engineering four years ago. I'm the project manager for the entire thing. And how big is your team? Just me right now. Okay. How many people do you need on your team? I don't know, two or three more. Probably need at least 20, 25 maybe. <laughs> they had no clue what they were getting into. So, and we've seen it, we've all seen it a dozen times or more in Vietnam. Looks great on paper, stops there, never moves forward. But that doesn't always have to be the case. Oops, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I ran into the building engineer for Texco the other day. He said he was going to come, but he didn't show up. Uh, yeah, he's the, the building engineer, and uh, he understands very well some of the issues that have happened with with Texco. Uh, he has to deal with it day to day. But I want to focus on here's another case study 
Uh, we do a lot of what we call technical due diligence reports. Right? Uh, people looking to invest in properties, so we're able to provide a due diligence service. Uh, and it allows us to see and investigate quite a number of interesting cases. Is that the Nexco feature as well? That, no, that is not the Nexco feature. You want to take a guess at how old this building is? 15 years or two. Very good. Okay. Uh, one of the first attempts at using uh, post tension concrete slabs in Vietnam. Owner, developer, Z, you know, I'm not going to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll show you later. <laughs> I won't tell. Okay. Um, no, but I'm going to hire a great structural engineer from Australia. All right, they're going to do all this and design this great building for me. It's going to be the most efficient use of space. I can get bigger space, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Rather than keeping the structural engineer on for uh, through the procurement process and through the construction uh, management or administration process, I don't want to pay your fees. Your fees are too high. You know, if you're, if every trip to to Vietnam is going to cost me money, so I'll just have my contractor take care of all this. And by the way, I'm going to hire a real cheap contractor to do this thing as cheaply as I can. Anyway, the contractor didn't really know how to do it because they've never done it before. Two or three years later, occupier starts to notice that I would say, you know, the doors close, but all the doors start swinging open without doing anything. And we start looking at the outside of the building and we notice this funny strip just kind of tacked onto the side of the building. I'm like, what's this? There's no caulking, there's no waterproofing or anything like that. It's like, well, and we looked into it and we found the, the out of build drawings and et cetera, et cetera, and we found that all the ends, the cables where you pull them, have been left exposed. And they just tack this thing to cover them. Right? So eventually, what had happened, since they hadn't covered it properly, they had rusted or began to, uh, say, lose their, their tensile strength. And from what we can see, a good one quarter to one third of the entire floor slab had lost its strength. So all of a sudden, we have huge structural cracks. Right? We went up onto the top floor where they had, of course, like they do in Vietnam, add another story. Right? Lightweight steel structure. The whole thing, the whole structure was in, was, was the torsion, right? And twisted like that because of the whole slab. Twisted like that, and I'm sorry, this is a a place occupied by many people, maybe even some of your loved ones. So quite a very, very dangerous situation. Plus, they had the ongoing problem of every time the slab would shift a little bit more subtle, the windows cracked. <laughs> they were replacing at least two to three windows a week because this building is settling so quickly and, and had lost its structural integrity. Anyway, needless to say, our client did not purchase this building. But it's something that happens once again, brought about by the desire to do it cheap right? and not listen to consultants that you have. The champagne pay, the taste, beer budget, yeah, it's a good, uh, <laughs> uh, good one I think we all run into many ways. So, but, uh, my favorite response, and you've heard me say it a thousand times, you know, <laughs> if you wanted to achieve you pay peanuts, you're going to get monkeys. That's all there is to it. So, corners need to be cut. If you really want that, yeah, contractor's going to cut corners. You'll, you'll admit to it. <laughs> okay, yeah, corners got to be cut. But what we always say to our clients, is 90% of it, right? The, the, the final project, the final building, the final fit out, 90% of the effort that went into it, you can't see. And those are where the corners are cut. So 
this wonderful wall. Nice, beautiful finish, nice veneer. Right? This room needs to be physically private. Right? So the contractor had to cut cost. He's going to cut it cost in the substrate for this, in the jib board, how he constructs the wall, the amount of insulation in the wall. The client can't see that. Tom just cut the corners there. You know, they want 80 kilogram insulation. 40 is fine. No one will ever know. But the fact is, the client will know later on down the line. And it's harder to fix at that point in time. Oh, I see we've got a little timer here. Three more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll take a stab at that one too. Champagne taste of your budget. Been at, you know, Chinese Plaza in, in Hanoi. Another uh, very similar situation. Um, that I was involved with. So. Um, always been done this way. One of the things uh, dealing with design built traditional uh, form of delivery in, in Vietnam. All right. And I want to say the model, design and build itself, is in conflict. So, I mean, how exactly does a design and build management model work? How can you design something well and build it well? when you're trying to make money, which is the prime motivator. You can't do it. Consequently, a lot of transparency issues will pop up. I gave the case about the, uh, the cost assessment later on. So, um, yeah, you're gonna have change orders, okay? You're gonna have problems uh, later on. Like maybe some of you have seen in the room have seen this before. The classic, one of my favorites. Um, But not understand. Original contract is smaller than that big. Yeah. So the value of the original contract that big, but <coughs> through change orders, right? Once again, going cheap on design, uh, cheap on construction, cheap on specifications, not understanding what the full program was for the building or the bid up. Right? There's a ton of what we call change orders. Right? So you know, in the beginning, you know, the, the client said, "I want a, a wonderful meeting room." Okay. So architect goes and designs the meeting room, table, big nice chairs. Halfway into construction, someone says, "Well, I need to give presentations in that meeting room. So I need to be able to dim the lights. Is there a light dimmer in there? No. Okay, we've got to add it in after the fact. That becomes a change order." So if you don't go through the right program and design process early, the right budgeting process early on, change orders happen. So what this slide is showing is the value of the original contract is only that big, but because the client didn't go about the process of design and construction properly, the value of the change orders was huge. Enough to get a whole yacht. <laughs> so that's the joke behind that. I'll say. Conversely, this happened recently with one of our projects, and I'm going to do this in 10 minutes. Uh, I made the statement to the client, I think it's actually going to be cheaper for you to buy all new furniture rather than to reuse your old furniture. And just completely floored the client. So this is the end result. The client thought, as you would, if I reuse all my furniture, it's going to be cheaper. Than buying all new furniture. Right? What we said was, I, was, I don't think so. I think there's a lot more to it, and let us investigate. So we did. And we went through you know, to analyzing the, the volume that the lifts could handle in terms of moving furniture, the volume that had to be moved, the time frame that we had to move, the technical requirements, right, and the time frame needed to set up the technical requirements. And we had an eight day move period. Right? To move things, physically move the volume of desks that they had, which is around 2,000 workstations, to physically move that was going to take three weeks because the lifts were so small. So, option, if we put a construction place inside of the building, now, first the landlord's not going to be happy with it, but how much is it? We look into it, how much for that cost? 
Uh, we looked at other options of phasing the move and what would need uh, for a VPN. We had to establish a, a connection between the old office and the new office, let alone set up a, a temporary server room before we made the big move. Turns out the cost for all doing all that added up to be more than buying new furniture. So, in the end, we said, we'll buy new furniture. And we made the quality of the working environment 10 times better than what they had before. So, that's good involvement from a project manager in looking at the entire picture, the big picture. Okay. So, uh, just uh, we'll kind of cruise through these real quick. Uh, yeah, lack of skilled experience, resources, understanding new techniques. Yeah, we've seen that a dozen times. Um, but coming from our, our, our various backgrounds, uh, I think it's part of uh, what we do here in Vietnam, or contribute to Vietnam, and however long we stay here, to help better the construction design industry. So we made this, uh, I don't say, painfully clear to a local developer. One of our largest clients, or say the developer was doing a, a built to suit building for our client, and they just couldn't get the floor screed right. Could not do it right. And we told, we advised our client, and we told this particular landlord, stop the project, we're not moving in. We're not going to take possession of this space in this condition. And the landlord, ah, you can't do that, blah, 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 blah. And we said, we advised the client quite simply, if you move in with the floor in this condition, it's going to cost you more money over the next five years to come the same. Stop working, move all those people out, pull the desk off, re-screed the floor, relay all your cable, move them all back in. The disruption that you're going to face over the next five years is going to be immense. And, you know, and the, the client agreed with us, promptly went back to the landlord and said, fix it. Landlord being Vietnamese, ah, no, it's fine, it's fine, we're not going to do anything, didn't do anything, didn't do anything. All of a sudden, the project is delayed, right? What was originally planned is that the first month of rent, you know, quite a sizable sum, $80,000, $90,000. All of a sudden, fine, we're not paying. We haven't started our fit out yet, we're not paying. And it's going to take at least another three months to finish our fit out, and we're not going to pay during that period. All of a sudden, the landlord realized real quick, uh-oh, I'm losing money, a lot of money. So they quickly came back to us and said, Charles, how do we do a screed the right way? So well, it's not my scope of work to tell you that. <laughs> but we got involved. We helped them out. Sure enough, within three weeks, it was sorted out. All right, we, we went ahead and did our fit out and uh, completed everything on time. So the came back to, quite simply, is landlord not understanding you know, new methods or different methods, um, control and quality is what's important. We really lost a lot of money for it. Okay. So, anyway, um, just to wrap up real quick, you know, what we're talking about, you know, the general thinking here in Vietnam or in Asia, like I said, uh, low dollar, low cost expectations. Right? Unrealistic quality and short timeline, driven by inexperience, right? Misunderstanding of value and quality expectations, driven by uninformed ego. Okay. Those are some of the challenges that we face in this market, in any emerging market. Okay. And these challenges, uh, let's say, directly translate or carry it over to you know, uh, ourselves as project managers, designers, engineers, you know, to the jet board supplier. Okay, to the furniture manufacturer. So it's important is to recognize them. Right? It happens every day. You need to recognize them and more importantly, be able to push back with them. Right? One way to push back is to encourage your clients or whoever you're working with or working for to take the time to plan correctly. You know, if you're not sure how much it costs to build a mega development or a mega city, geez, hire Turner. Let them do a cost analysis for you. All right? I can't do that. It's a little bit too big. All right, hire the two of you together. Okay. All right. We got Polly. Polly. Yeah. Um, but I think Charles, just on that, I think one of the 
don't want to sort of interrupt the presentation. But yeah, no. one, of, one of them, one of them, the first drivers for this is getting the budget right at the beginning. Yeah, and I think that if, if your client is or the client is educated enough and has the right, gets the right advice, then a lot of these problems go away because he's yep. got the right budget to start with. Exactly, and I think that's that's where we've got to get the problem sorted out is right at the very beginning with unrealistic expectations. Exactly, with what's what you can get for your for your dollars, I and mean, it is the champagne versus beer thing, but but it's at a very early stage in the whole process that that has to be sorted out. Yeah, um, you know the the you know coming into Vietnam five years ago now, um, looking at where uh, the state of the design and engineering. Uh, industry or field was at that point project management and also construction, mm. right? All of them were, you know, said Western style project management, Western style construction, all in their infancy, even as, as recently as five years ago, and they were just beginning to come out, right? Ever slow, <laughs> ever painful, okay. Uh, Five years later, I mean, because of the economic situation, Vietnam slowdowns, whatever you want to call it. Unfortunately, and I'm quite not necessarily sad. Um, yeah, a lot of our competitors have left. A lot of the good designers and the good engineers have left Vietnam. I mean, that's Vietnam's biggest loss right now. You know, groups like I guess. For designs, um, I was kind of still here. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you, know, you guys are the yeah, HOK, yeah, HOK yeah. left. Um, you know, people like Gensler, they were going to come, but they not nah, forget it. But right now, that's that's the biggest loss, biggest challenge. So there's less people to educate the client. So, um, like I said with the example with, with men here, right? We need to work with our friends, our colleagues. If you are working with clients, right? don't be afraid to say push back a little. Say you got to do it the right way from the beginning. Set it up the right way. Like I told you about the guy who wants to do his. Fancy resort in Nha Trang. So, I'm not going to take your money. All right, I can give you a fee for for me to do the whole project over the next 18, 24 months. All right, I know now, 90% surety, I will never see that entire fee because you won't get past phase one. So, here's my fee for phase one. Let's sit down. All right, I'll bring Colin along. We'll sit down and we'll work out a proper budget, a proper program. You know, stand the finger. Is there electricity on this line? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyway, he's going to get back to me. Chances are, yeah, I'll never hear. Because he'll go down the street and say, you know, my uncle, the electrician in, in Ben Che, is going to say, ah, it's easy to do, no problem, you know, $200 a square meter, you can do the whole thing. Your budget's fine. There could be living in straw huts in this high end resort that he wants. So, um, anyway, like I said, you know, open minded approach, patient approach, informed. All right, I think that's part of the duty of all of us while we're working here in Vietnam is to create good situations, to create a better environment. In the end, everyone benefits. You know, Turner, what you did at Vitexco, I mean, everyone. You can see the thing. Safety netting on the side of the building. Great stuff. All right. I think it's maybe the first time I saw it, but I don't know if it's direct or indirect, but that's bird Wabin to put together a whole safety program. All right. Looking out of that injuries. Yeah. Exactly. King Man Town can do the people down. Yeah, King Man Town. Yeah, exactly. 20 people die. Right. No one has. Because Turner brought the expertise, the experience to put together a proper safety program. Unheard of in Vietnam to that point. 
you put it in place, you save the lives, everyone notice. And it spread a little bit. Alright? So that like that. A lot of dodgy things still going on, right? But overall, um, things are better. We just need to keep let's say patience, keep pushing forward more and more. So I'll keep talking to him every time I get a chance. Um, if you get a chance to talk to him, talk to him, please. Alright. Uh, he represents the next generation of Vietnam, the Vietnamese. Right? Young, energetic, intelligent, wants to learn. So I'm going to teach him. <laughs> <laughs> so,